Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can I welcome everyone to the second meeting of the Education Skills Committee of 2018? And I'm very pleased to be chairing a meeting of this committee in my hometown of Glasgow, and pleased to welcome all members, witnesses and observers to the meeting. As background, the committee is responsible for scrutinising the Scottish Government in relation to its education policy. And in recent months, the committee has been taking evidence on the education reforms that the Government is consul consulting on at the moment. The result of the committee's work will be recommendations to government on the reforms, including how they should be changed and improved. Today, we are hearing from education authorities that sit on the Regional Improvement Collaborative that covers the west of Scotland. These collaboratives of education authorities are part of the reforms. After the session, we will have a more informal discussion on all the reforms starting at 6 p.m. We have received apologies for this meeting from a number of members who have either taken part uh, uh, in other parts of the day. Liz Smith uh, was with us earlier in the day for local visits and widening access. George Adams sends his apologies. Richard Lockhead and Ross Greer are on their way here from a European Committee event so they can take part in the informal discussions at the end. Apologies are also received from Oliver Mundell. We are hoping to be joined by Sandra White, MSP, who is a local MSP and is keen to be part of the discussions on education today. Can I also welcome the witnesses to the meeting? Mary Shaw. Regional Lead Officer, Glasgow City Region Education Improvement Collaborative and Director of Education, East Renfrewshire Council. Ruth Binks, Head of Education, Inverclyde Council. And Maureen McKenna, Executive Director of Education Services, Glasgow City Council and President of the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland. I understand that Mary intends to make a short opening statement before we move to questions. Ha ha happy to do that. Thank you, Convener. Um, this morning, I was very pleased to attend the first meeting of the Glasgow City Region Education Improvement Collaborative Education Committee uh, and, and pleased to, that the committee decided to endorse, after having examined uh, our first uh, improvement plan. It is a high-level plan, uh, as members will have noted at this point. Uh, it will now be submitted to um, the Chief Executive of Education Scotland for approval uh, and thereafter will continue to evolve indeed as the practices within the Regional Improvement Collaborative evolve. It is organised under three themes. Uh, those have been <coughs> identified uh, by the Education Directorates or Chief Education Officers uh, within the Collaborative and the three themes are improvement, um, early learning and childcare and learner journey, which essentially looks at the curriculum. We will be happy to take any questions and uh, respond to any uh, detail that, that, that the committee may, may want to have in terms of their consideration of our improvement plan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, before we, we move to questions on the number of themes, the first theme being previous practice and collaboration in school education, I will kick off with a question about sharing good practice. One of the main purposes of the collaborative is to share best practice. Are there examples of how successes in one part of the region covered by the West Partnership have been shared and recreated in other places? And how do you see the regional collaborative supporting sharing best practice in the future? Yes, please. Um, with your permission, I, I think one of the areas that we have been very successful in uh, has been the moderation of assessment in the broad general education. That uh, has been a model that initiated uh, in East Renfrewshire has been shared across the partnership with the original four um, education authorities. That would be the pan Renfrewshire ones in Glasgow, and this year is also being um, rolled out to the other four. Uh, the two Lanarkshires and the two Dumbartonshires. I am also pleased to say that the South West Partnership in uh, covering the Ayrshires and Dumfries and Galloway is going to adopt a similar sort of approach. And that will enable collaboration between collaboratives, indeed, in making sure that all teachers are on the same page when, when it comes to um, assessing and, and, and moderating the, those assessments. Maureen has also led some work in terms of improving maths uh, within the collaborative, and that may be some other areas where we are able to identify best practice and share that. Would you like to come in at this point, Maureen? Uh, yes, 
Surely, um, the, the improving maths work that we've done um, has uh, reaped dividends. Billy Burke, from, um, who's the head teacher at uh, Renfrew High School, um, was a lead part of that, and we set up a small group um, to look at maths on the back of um, the report of the group that I chair, Making Maths Count. Um, and it's, the work to date has been very positively received. Of course, it's far too early to be able to say whether it's had a, a huge impact or not. And just this afternoon, um, I chaired a group of the um, heads of service of representatives from the eight authorities leading on improvement. And one of the key areas that we are going to focus on is sharing best practice and sharing best practice around quality assurance um, processes, around providing, uh, building the capacity of leadership of head teachers, um, of staff, of a lo a local authority personnel as well. Um, use of data and also sharing practice across um, very good HR practices and working with our professional associations. So sharing practice, we have some emerging evidence mm -hmm. um, of where uh, we, we have used this as a good way forward, and I think there's huge potential for us to take this forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ruth, would you like to come in at this point? And just to build on what my colleagues have said, um, first, first of all, looking at the moderation, um, this, was, this was a very good aspect of collaboration, um, talking from Inverclyde's point of view, because we had an authority that had a well-established model that we could learn from, um, and so, so some, something that was already in place, well-established, and tried out was then um, rolled out across, the, across other authorities. But it also gave um, authorities chances to work together and teachers chances to work together so we could take forward moderation of standards. Um, the, the maths work that Maureen was, was speaking about, you know, making maths count. We've learnt a lot from the collaborative work between the quality improvement officers, um, sh sharing their experience and also taking improvements forward. And another area um, that hasn't been mentioned yet is in the early years, where there has been a huge amount of collaboration and joint learning across, across the West Partnership. Okay, thank you. Does any of the committee members have any questions they'd like to raise? Mina? Thank you, Convener. I just wanted to ask a very brief supplementary on that. Is there enough scope within the collaborative to allow each local authority to perhaps have quite unique and distinctive plans? Or is there a baseline across the collaborative that each local authority must meet? Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, the, the collaborative's plan is um, designed to enhance the provision of local authorities, um, uh, which will be much more detailed and much more uh, focused on the self-evaluation and, and analysis of that that will come out of each local authority. It is about where we have opportunities to collaborate and learn from best practice across the region, which will improve practices mm. across the region, but within local authorities. So y yes, at the moment, I, I would say that that um, is accurate. Um, of course, as it grows, or um, indeed as is intended in the Education Bill, we, we need to wait and see how things are going to sort of work out. Thank you. And then Julie. Thank you. Convener, can I just ask a, a question about the plans that you've been describing? Um, there's, a, there's a school improvement plan, a cluster improvement plan, um, a pupil equity improvement plan. Uh, there's now to be a regional collaborative improvement plan. On top of that, or underneath that, depending on how you look at it, there's a national improvement framework. We've got a heck of a lot of plans. How are head teachers meant to know which plan is their plan? Um, I agree with you. However, uh, each authority has uh, a different setup. For example, um, in Glasgow, we don't have cluster plans. Um, so there would be a school improvement plan that would link to a local authority plan, and the regional improvement plan is a, is a high-level one, as you can see. It is not intended in any way to replace or usurp what's happening at a local authority level. What's important is that we have that element of golden thread coming through, and that if the collaborative is to be successful, it must enhance, not replace, what is delivered at a local level. The evidence base shows clearly that it is, you know, from international evidence, that it is local based improvement is what makes a difference. So we couldn't say by any stretch of the imagination that a collaborative is going to be the answer to all things to all men. We are a very large um, collaborative. Mm -hmm. 
um, huge population and there is no expectation or assumption that all eight authorities will be doing the same thing at the same time. And part of the work we're doing just now is about scoping out where is that good practice, where can people share, if it is good practice already happening in your local authority, why would you change just for the sake of a collaborative? Um, it's about our focus is on outcomes and on improving outcomes, not on the inputs. There still are going to be different tiers of plans, and I don't frankly understand how these all interrelate against each other. Or and which I get asked the same question: which plan is the school's plan? Is it, there, is it the school improvement plan, and therefore do all these other things are less important than that school improvement plan? No, I don't think, I'll, I'll, come, I'll revert to Mary, I don't think they're less important, absolutely not. And um, when you look at that, the, the clear evidence of what makes a difference is at a local authority level, or indeed at a collaborative level, you choose a small number of key priorities, you stick to them, and you keep them high level, and schools then tie in um, theirs, but they have their own um, ability to design locally in partnership with their parents, with their young people, with their staff, what makes a difference there. And there is a golden thread that runs between them. But it's not that one has a priority over the other, but you should be able to link them together. And the key is that you make your, your plan at that high level with priorities that schools recognise and tie into that are the important things, such as raising attainment and achievement, such as improving outcomes for children and young people. And head teachers are then able to um, design specific actions that will achieve those outcomes. Can I just ask you what you mean by the golden thread? A golden thread that it links, so that you can see the thread that links yeah. from the National Improvement Framework all the way down, and there should be a golden thread that runs from there all the way down into classrooms. In, and in that context, in Glasgow, is that your response? I'm just trying to understand the accountability here. Is that your responsibility, do you think, to provide that golden thread? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. And would, yes. that be, would that be also the case in your other respective areas of, of the West? Mary. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think what's important to remember is that school improvement plans are based on the, the priorities identified from the school self-evaluation. Now, you can take that to lots of different levels, but essentially that then feeds into the local improvement plan, but there's also other priorities that come in, or drivers that come in, in terms of the national improvement framework. And we're all essentially working to the same uh, agenda, mm -hmm. uh, as, as Maureen has already mentioned. But just to reiterate and reinforce what Maureen has said, it is about managing, and indeed managing the workload of staff, mm. to be able to take forward the priorities. So it should be a small number of priorities that they deepen uh, and, um, and continue to sort of dig into, to continue to review, to see the impact of the actions that they've taken, and then move from that. That they are all interlinked, um, but essentially school improvement plans do have primacy, mm -hmm. uh, and indeed where there is opportunity to collaborate, where, for instance, say schools of similar demograph demographics or indeed of similar outcomes that need or underperformance that needs to be improved, can collaborate together to, to bring about that improvement uh, at, and through those sorts of reviews. And that might be a separate plan or an action plan altogether. Sure. So schools are used to working to different plans and contributing to local improvement plans. In East Renfrewshire, we don't expect all of our schools to take forward every priority or action that's set out in that. Mm. But where that reflects their own self-evaluation and priorities, then uh, certainly that it would enhance and indeed uh, contribute to the outcomes from the local improvement plan across the authority. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I recognise the golden thread that Maureen's referring to, and it's the outcomes for children. Um, the, and reading different improvement plans, you can see that golden thread already quite clearly linking to the national improvement framework, linking to attainment, um, raising attainment and closing the attainment uh, related to poverty attainment gap. I think what 
the additionality of local authorities and the regional improvement collaborative give is the level of support to schools to take that forward. Schools want to take this forward and they can do so in different ways. Sometimes they can do it with collaboration with other schools. Sometimes it could be collaborative with the, with the local authority and the emerging practice that's coming out and is already there about regional collaboratives and how we can join together. Mm -hmm. So I think that the golden thread is the impact and the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Everything else is how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I can come back to support later on. There's a number of questions later on. Yeah, yeah. Explain that Tavish, Joanne and I have just come out fresh from a focus group with head teachers, so I'm going to raise some of the points that, that they had around regional improvement collaboratives. How are we going to ensure that a regional improvement collaborative is not another layer of administration or that it isn't top down in any way rather than collaborating with our practitioners on the ground and being bottom up? Mm. The, um, our own plan uh, has indeed been shared by some of with with, with um, many of the head teachers within the West Partnership. I have to say, within East Renfrewshire, um, it was welcomed. Um, they they saw it as areas where they will be able to look outwardly uh, rather than inwardly within East Renfrewshire. Opportunities to share practice and to learn from practice. Uh, out with the, the realms or, or the boundaries of East Renfrewshire uh, and in that sort of sense would be able to enhance the practice that's there. And that's the, that's the way that our plan has been designed. The, the plan isn't something that we've just dreamt up as eight directors. It has been fully discussed, agreed on the, the three themes that um, we are working towards at the moment. That's not to say that those three themes will stay the same. They will they will evolve and change, but certainly um, it is based on what we think as directors our schools would benefit from, which of course is based on the analysis of data and other information that we have um, from our own school reviews, our school inspections, uh, and indeed the analysis of attainment. So we're not necessarily thinking that it's going to be an administrative it being, uh, or indeed a being in itself, we, we, we see it as enhancing the support that's already in place for schools uh, and where we might be able to learn from best practice across the region. Does that answer your question? Thank well, you yeah, um, it really was questions from head teachers, so that's why I was putting it forward. Yep. I thought it was an opportunity. A lot of them have actually stayed back to, 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 to watch today's <laughs> proceedings. So. Yeah, just to come in. Um, I agree. I mean, I agree there is a danger that the improvement collaborative could become an additional layer of bureaucracy. Um, I don't disagree with that point at all. I think it's incumbent upon us to ensure that it doesn't add that extra layer of bureaucracy. And that's why that we need in these um, early days, um, and it is very early days of, of the improvement collaborative, that we do work together positively and that we're constantly mindful of the importance of reducing bureaucracy. So in, in our plan, I would hope that you would recognise that it is very minimalist. It's very high level. Um, we've had um, interesting discussions um, with elements of the Scottish Government who would be would like the plan um, at the outset to be much more, um, much heavier, much more detailed. And we are resisting that. And we're absolutely resisting it in the West. And we're all um, signed up to that because we are very mindful of the complexities that are involved around planning. Because let's not forget, it's not just about um, education authority plans. There's also children's services plans. There's the community planning partnership. And so it goes on and on. And so we cannot allow an improvement collaborative to become an extra layer or to be viewed in any way and as an administrative burden. It must enhance and add value or else it's not worth doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I suppose what I'm interested in, if the Scottish Government hadn't suggested these regional collaboratives, would you have been campaigning for them? And I think collaboration, who would be against collaboration? We're all in favour of it. Professionally, people will learn from each other anyway. There are local structures. I wonder if, weren't being, I, because you said earlier, if it is going to work, then such and such has to happen. I wonder whether um, this is something you're going to have to make work or whether it's something you'd positively advocate. 
I'll, I suppose I'll come in with my president of ADES hat on. Um, ADES has been actively promoting um, collaboration across uh, authorities for at least the last two, three years. Um, I wouldn't describe us as campaigning, Joanne. Um, we've certainly not campaigned for the regional improvement collaboratives. Um, and there's elements of it that have still got to be tested in the system. Uh, they're not an entity. Um, and we have to ensure that, that it's managed appropriately. However, there are huge advantages in, in working together. Um, and there is, as Mari has already said, um, a huge advantage in having us being able to kind of lift our heads and being able to look outward and to be able to learn from each other. And I don't think that we do that often enough um, because as we get kind of, you know, the, the daily grind of the work, and that goes in schools um, as well as in local authorities. So collaboration gives us that opportunity to look outward um, and to be able to learn from each other. And the trick will be for us to be able to manage that so that it does add value. There's a danger of a conflation between the benefits of collaboration and endorsing regional collaboration bodies, which will have their own budget. We don't quite know how they would look, but would it not be, well, if I were, were sceptical on the question of it, would it not be as reasonable to say it's so high level, local authorities are so diverse, even within the West, so diverse in terms of need, demographics, landscape, whatever, that actually the logic would be to say there should be collaboration on education at a Scottish level, and that it's possible to do that in different kinds of ways. We do not need to create a structure in order to do that. And I wonder whether... You have said that you have resisted the idea that it should be heavier. The Scottish Government wants it perhaps to be more directive. Is that not the purpose of them in truth? Um, I don't believe that, that spending time on restructuring, and I don't believe that, that the regional improvement collaboratives should be a structure per se. Um, they should be about a way of working as opposed to a way of being. And I'm a... I remain to be convinced about them having an allocated budget and how that would be. They're not an entity. Nobody is going to be employed by a regional improvement collaborative at this point in time. And I think, as I say, that we have to work across the West. I think there are advantages. I think there's lots um, that we learn from each other. Um, you wouldn't describe East Renfrewshire and Glasgow um, as remotely similar in terms of demograph, but I think there is lots that we can learn from, for example, as we have done in, in the past in the way that East Renfrewshire um, goes about quality improvement. I've learned a huge amount. Um, I'm sure Mary would have examples where East Renfrewshire has done the same with Glasgow partnerships. So I think, uh, I don't think you have to be the same in order to be able to work together effectively or indeed to learn from each other. There's always learning that goes on even from poor so practice. Why does it have to be at a regional level then? Given the diversity within the West, you could argue that diversity is expressed right across Scotland Quite, um, you know, I can't tell you how much I love the idea of collaboration. I'm just, I'm not clear why there needs to be a regional level collaboration. What you're talking about is continuous improvement, getting best practice, mm -hmm. understanding Absolutely. diversity. There's diversity within Glasgow, for goodness sake. There's already that level of collaboration. I'm not arguing for, their, for the regional improvement collaboratives to be entities. Joanne, I think that's a question for the Scottish Government. Okay. Could I bring in with at this point? Um, just, just to, to come in, Authorities have always collaborated with each other. I mean, Addis is a, a very good example of that. And certainly as a small authority, we rely on collaboration um, to, to take us forward. And we very much enjoyed the training gain that we get from each other. Um, I think what this, this has done is formalized that kind of collaboration rather than made it ad hoc, um, is, is, is given us a structure with which to work. There are huge advantages with that. There are also challenges, um, but the, the, none of these are insurmountable challenges that we can't take forward. But I think putting a, a framework and a formalization around it is probably a, a good place to start at least. Yeah, I suppose just to, to, to finish this point, that this is the regional collaboratives are being you know, are being promoted as a way of tackling some of the challenges. You're already you're telling me you're already doing this, but there's now a formal structure. So what I need to ask, what I'm interested in, is actually what is the claims for it. it either it's already getting done and we're just formalising it, or it's going to bring an added value, which I don't get a sense of. And I'm interested in where you sit in that. You see that. The, if it's you looking for a formal entity, is that right? 
Can I, can I just come in before that? Can I just ask, uh, when you said it's already happening, is it happening all, all across the country? Are these collaboratives happening in, in uh, the same way, uh, you know, in terms of relationships across the country? I, I, uh, Maureen, Maureen mentioned the ADES improvement partnerships, actually, that had been formed almost about two and a bit years or so ago. Uh, and I, I think it would be fair to say that those are at different levels of maturity. Uh, and indeed, um, we started out as a much smaller, I made a, a sort of sales pitch in the East and Western Bartonshire and North and South Lanarkshire decided to join us because they liked the direction of travel that we were going in. They saw that there would be benefits for them in joining a, a and um, contributing to the work that we are doing. I think we do, though, at the moment, uh, and I, I think there is um, acceptance nationally across the whole of the education community that we do have a moral purpose. And I think everyone is signed up to that moral purpose of improving attainment, improving outcomes for youngsters. And I, and I think that collaborating to take that forward, whether that's on a school-by-school -school basis, or, or, or indeed on a cluster by cluster basis or in a local authorities uh, collaborating together, it is worthwhile, as you, as you know uh, and as research shows. But there is no intention that the West Partnership and that every local authority within the West Partnership will do everything within the plan because they'll not, I mean, in East Renfrewshire, we have expertise in data analysis and, as Maureen says, in quality improvement. But we have opportunity as well to learn from the excellent classroom practices that there are in Glasgow and other areas within, uh, within the collaborative. So there is opportunity for us all and all our youngsters at the end of the day to benefit from that. Yeah, well, You've already clear, had that. Clearly, uh, the point that was made was not across the country. I'd like to move on to uh, changing roles of head teachers and local authority. Uh, could you give me a view of what you think these, uh, the greater collaboration and the role of head teachers will, will mean uh, through these reforms? How the role of head teachers is going to change through these reforms? Feel free. Through the form set out in the education bill, yeah, or yeah. I, I, I think certainly I think it's careful to remember that uh, that is a consultation. I'm, I'm not sure what members have heard today from head teachers. I mean, certainly um, within East Renfrewshire, I can say that some will welcome the reforms. I can also say that some may have some concerns about the reforms and think that they are not going to have the support of the local. Uh, authority. Now, that, that will depend on uh, confidence growing, I would think. But certainly, um, we would expect that we will support our head teachers. We embrace the, uh, the head teachers' charter. Um, certainly, it is the direction of travel that we are already going on in terms of um, devolving budget and all of the budget possible to head teachers. We already have uh, devolved management in terms of the curriculum uh, and certainly within broad guidance, which reflects the national guidance, uh, to make sure that um, and to have that challenge and discussion to make sure that at the heart of that, that it is uh, youngsters' outcomes and improvement in outcomes are uh, expected. I, I, I think sometimes head teachers get a wee bit, a, a wee bit, can, a, a wee bit frightened almost about the, the management of the budget uh, and whether or not they're going to become accountants. I don't think that's going to be the case, but certainly we need to make sure that they have the support of those with that expertise to be able to make the decisions that they want to make. Um, in terms of uh, what it might mean at class teacher level, I don't expect that that is going to change significantly. I, I, I would say that class teachers are already expected to meet the individual needs of youngsters within their class, and they do that by designing a curriculum at that level, almost at an individual pupil level, for uh, where it's necessary for to make sure that children continue to achieve. But managing that at a, at a school level, indeed, is something about, it is about freeing up. It is about sort of giving class teachers and head teachers more autonomy, but making sure there's still accountabilities within there. And I see the local authority continuing to play a crucial role 
uh, in having those challenging and uh, professional discussions where the outcomes are maybe not what we want them to be, or indeed to learn uh, where outcomes have changed because of curriculum design. Uh, and that is something that we have built into our plan through the learner journey theme. Okay, does anybody else have any comment on this one? I've got a couple of other questions. I'm sure others do as well. Well, I I'll uh, let Tavish in just one second. To whom head will head teachers be accountable for the performance of their schools? As employers, they'll still be accountable to local authorities. I think the Education Bill sets out um, <coughs> you know, accountability at a very local level, um, certainly to communities and to other stakeholders, uh, parents and pupils and so on, but that's the case at, at the moment. Um, and, and certainly it would be our view that local authorities will continue to be those uh, bodies that head teachers will be essentially accountable to. If the head teacher breaks that golden thread, it will be the local authority they will be responsible to. Right, okay. Tavish? Thank you, uh, Kavita. That's a very useful answer you just gave, believe me. Um, one of the head teachers at the session that Gillian was just describing before, um, earlier this afternoon, described her, the change in her role as moving from being the leader of learning to a business and HR manager. I'm not sure we'd all want it to go that way. What, what's your view of, of that? Because you've very fairly just described the support that needs to go into if this role is to be as the head, the head teacher charter envisages it. That strikes me as a HR and business manager rather than a leader of learning. What do you think our head teachers should be? Okay, um, the head teachers are naturally nervous about about this. Um, there is no there's no direction wanting them to to be HR and business business managers, um, and I think we have to be. The, they currently welcome the challenge and support that are given by local authorities, and I think um, there's an air of, of wanting to, to keep that. Um, so therefore, I think there's a nervousness around head teachers about what this looks like, but they remain absolutely with the, the main objective is those outcomes for learners, and making sure that everything that goes in behind that makes sure that they get the outcomes for learners. Head teachers are in, in a good position to be able to monitor that, to, to take that through through improvement plans and self-evaluation, and to ensure that all the bits and pieces are in place there. But they, they are nervous that that might be weaked away from them. I can understand that. The intention is not to go down that if, if, if I could add to that a wee bit, I, I mean, I, I have been a head teacher of um, a number of primary schools. I would consider myself as a leader of learning in East Renfrewshire, uh, uh, and indeed in contributing to that at a regional level as well. Um, you deal with the budget maybe two or three times a year, and, and then essentially you get on with it. You make sure that the way you allocate resources reflects your school improvement plan and the priorities within that. The HR issues will still uh, be um, <clears throat> supported by the local authority as intended uh, by the bill. But more importantly, the investment in people w will continue to be a an opportunity to improve practice and improve outcomes. That's not an HR issue, but, but indeed a, a continuous learning uh, opportunity. And, and that's something that, that we are also planning to learn from best practice across, the, across our partnership. Um, thank you. I think it's incumbent upon us in terms of the head teacher's charter to ensure, as Mary said, this is a consultation. It's, it's, not a, it's not agreed that this is what's going to happen. And I think it's for us to um, ensure through our responses to the consultation that we ensure that the best practice is what comes out. We want our head teachers, I like the head teacher's charter in terms of its principles. I absolutely sign up that head teachers should be appointing their own staff, should decide in their management structures, should develop the curriculum in line with their local needs. But we need to be careful that we're not creating a hero innovator system. Um, it talks about the head teacher, but actually best practice is when the whole community is engaged in it. And it reads at the moment as if all roads lead to one person. So I understand why head teachers are 
a number of them are understandably nervous. So we need to be careful. If the Head Teachers Charter ends up embedded in legislation, then there could be a lot of unintended consequences that will cause us all difficulty. As the local authority remains as the employer, then they remain that accountable force. And I think we need to work positively, looking at the policy intention to ensure that we can deliver on the policy intention, but without some of those unintended consequences, because we all agree head teachers need to be leaders of learning, but they also need to have an eye on these other activities, and it's for, uh, for local authorities who have a, a, can provide that framework of support to be able to guide them through that. Just ask, um, if head teachers' roles do change, and you're all employers in that sense, I suppose, um, is it fair, and many of us said this to us today, that um, if you augment their responsibilities, you're changing their terms and conditions of employment? So is it, is it fair, then, that many are saying, that's a change, a material change to my circumstances, that has consequences for, for the profession, and therefore for me as an individual in terms of how much I'm paid, what my job is, and so on and so forth. Do you think that's the inevitable consequence of a big change to a head teacher's responsibilities? I think it's interesting that there's no mention in the consultation document yes. of SNCT. Yes. And the Scottish, which is the Scottish Negotiating Committee for Teachers, where you know they already set out what a head teacher's role is. So actually, if we are going to significantly change that, then it should go back to that tripartite structure that looks after all the negotiation. And uh, and and uh, it is it is odd that it's not mentioned in the consultation document. Yeah, I mean, I think the issue around the head teacher's chart, and very struck by the the meeting we had before about, with very committed professionals who do huge amounts, who are wanting to make the very best, want to serve the very best interests of the young people in, the, in their community, and they're expressing significant reservations about this. And I wonder whether a part of it is, it's either it's been sold as big change, but people have been reassured, oh, well, it's not really any great change at all. And I wonder which you think it is. I'll come in as Addis. I think if the head teacher's charter ends up in legislation in the way that it's written, it will have it will have significant repercussions for head teachers. And do you think that's to the detriment of the role as leaders of learning? I think that it would impact on their role as a leader of learning if all those responsibilities transfer over in a kind of a verbatim way. So if you interpret the way it's written in verbatim, i.e. they absolutely appoint every member of staff, support staff, clerical, janitors, you take all that, then of course it will radically change them. I'm not sure that is the intention of the policy, um, and that's why we need to work on accepting. I, I do sign up to the policy intention, but ensuring that the implementation achieves what it aims to, which is to improve outcomes for children and young people. I was very struck by what you said about hero in innovators. I think I worked with a few head teachers at the time who thought they were hero innovators, and the rest of the world didn't think that. Um, but I wonder whether, you know, again from the focus group and from elsewhere, there's been a suggestion rather than a head teacher's charter, there should be a school charter, which you then test the school and senior management team within that in terms of of how things are delivered, and I wonder what your view of that yeah. is. I, I would totally agree. I think there's insufficient emphasis on the importance of collegiality um, as a means of taking forward change, as a means of taking forward improvement, and to put it all roads leading to a head teacher um, is not a good approach to take. Okay. Okay. Oh, one last point, I suppose, is how do you, if there is going to be a head teacher's charter, how do you balance the accountability Yes, they have authority to do a huge amount. What structures we put in place in terms of accountability? When you devolve so much power to school level, where is the accountability around that, that would, would balance that? I would argue just now, certainly in Glasgow, um, that we do empower um, our head teachers and we do devolve a lot of responsibility out but it is within a strong framework of an accountability and a strong framework of accountability that they are part and parcel of 
It's not an either or. It's not about the authority versus the head teachers. Um, our head teachers are very much senior officers of the authority and need to take that collective responsibility for improvement. Um, and I think that we need to, to talk more about collective responsibility um, across schools. The, the, a good improving system, the, you know, the international research, those that are systemically improving are ones that are outward facing, that take responsibility for improvement, not just in their own school or in their own classroom, but in the next door classroom, in the next door school. And it's that collective approach is what makes a difference. So a head teacher couldn't decide, for example, in secondary school to only run three hires in the fifth year, or in primary school decide there were more prescriptive about young people who could come into school? I think at the moment, um, our head teachers decide, but they don't make that decision on their own. They decide on what they're going to offer um, in partnership with their parents, with the young people, and, and with their staff. And that the checks and balances in the system are the local authority wrap around, but it's very much that collective responsibility. I don't know any head teacher who would make a decision such as that all by themselves. No, but if they made that decision and they have autonomy to make that decision with the consequence that an individual pupil doesn't have the right to access the same opportunities at fifth year as they might have in another secondary school, who would be accountable for that? But, but, but that is the case just now. Correct. That, that there are schools where they might offer six hires from fourth year indeed and take a two year lead into that and others who continue to do uh, and offer five hires. So um, I, I'm not... Are there any offer three? I'm not aware, aware of, of any, and certainly with any Strengthshire, I don't know of any that only offer three. But um, th that would be for something... And, and quite frankly, I don't think parents would allow that to happen, because essentially they would vote with their feet. They, they just wouldn't attend or, or, or sign up to go to that school. So that, that would be a consequence of that. And indeed, that autonomy that, that head teachers may have to make those sorts of decisions, they have to measure those decisions against what are the likely outcomes for youngsters and indeed for the school itself uh, and, and whether the school continues to be viable. I, 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 can't, I can't see a school that would take such a drastic decision. OK. Uh, Mary? Uh, thank you, Convener. It's just a, a, a brief follow-on point, because it's interesting the point you make about working collectively, because the visit that, um, that, that we did um, earlier on in the afternoon, a concern was raised about while, in, in principle, the head teacher charter is, is very good, it has the potential to create a structure in the school where the head teacher sits there and tells the rest of the staff um, what will be happening in, in, in the school. And that was a concern that was raised, and I see by the nodding heads you you agree with, with, with that, um, that summary? And, and I suppose my question is, the head teacher charter as is, is it an easy fix to make it workable in schools or does radical change need to be done to it? I think the principles that are written in the head teacher's charter are ones that I would sign up to. But I think the sentences, um, you know, stop short. So the head teacher should appoint their own staff comma, within mm. a financial envelope, um, taking the caveat of, um, you know, welfare transfers of probationers. Mm. So I think there's, a, there's an interpretation, there's more needed to be looked at it, and that's why I worry about it being placed into legislation, because as soon as you put it into legislation, then, you know, a lot of mm. things become battened risks. down very quickly, and the risks increase. Mm. Okay. Um, good evening, panel. Thanks for being here. Um, I was going to ask this question under um, parental and community involvement, but I think it kind of ties into what um, Mary Fee was saying there. Um, when you speak about um, the head teacher's charter and perhaps the unintended consequences that, that could arise, and what struck us, in fact, a teacher raised it this afternoon, that the teacher voice actually isn't mentioned. Just re you reflect on that. <laughs> Just to, to backtrack a little bit, when we were looking at the, the supremacy of the head 
teacher. Um, when we see the best working practices, when head teachers work collaboratively alongside each other, um, we have a, a model where the, our head teachers co-designed a curriculum together, and it's it's a strong model. The, the downside of that model, where maybe where, where one school would like to do a slightly different one, if you've co-designed something as part of a collaborative, then you may feel you've got less autonomy. Um, and parental and community involvement, I think this is where we have to be very careful that um, within a parental community will be different opinions even within one school. So you, you can't always get a, a joined up joined up voice. Um, so, so when we look at collaboration, we have to be very careful that we're not taking just a few strong voices and making sure that the, the working together actually takes, takes things forward. I think um, head teachers enjoy working alongside each other. Um, I think there is, a, um, all of our head teachers enjoy working alongside their parents, their communities, and in the community of the school, I would include the teacher voice in that. I think I find very strong representatives of, of, of parent councils, parent partnerships, um, improvement plans, the, the PEF planning, where teacher's voice is heard. So I think there is room for, for everybody's voice in this, but we have to make sure that it is well managed and, and schools are maybe not picked off against each other. Yeah, I, I think importantly, uh, and what is set out in the bill is more uh, a focus of more on parental engagement. I, I think Ruth's right that um, there can be sort of a small number of strong voices, especially involved in, in parent councils that don't always reflect, but there are duties in there to make sure that parent councils do, re do um, reflect much more closely the demographic within the school, and, and that's, to be, uh, that's to be welcomed. H uh, however, um, I, I think more importantly, if it's about raising attainment and making sure that youngsters learn, it's more about parental engagement in learning uh, out with school and in school. Uh, and I think in best practice that is already happening uh, and indeed uh, will lead to those improved outcomes. Maureen? Yeah, well, well, just but I, I'd like to ask a question, Maureen, before you oh, come in, so okay. you can just... Don't worry, it's not a trick one. Okay. The, the, uh, you talked about school charter. Do you see that as being the, the same thing as the head teacher charter, but under a different name, so that it sounds more collaborative and, uh, and more all-inclusive? I, I think I, I am concerned about you know, the point about collegiality and, and the kind of absence of collegiality. And I suppose, should we get hung up in nomenclature? Um, however, um, you know, the, name, the title is really important because the title should sell should sell what, what it's about, you know, it's what it says on the tin. So if the head teacher's charter is telling us that it's all about the head teacher, then, then that is selling the wrong message. Whether it's school, nursery, establishment, I mean, I, I, I think the use of the school term is, is overused because we deliver education in a whole range of ways, services, units, um, not just the, the establishment of a school that people equate to a building. Um, so we do have to be careful and maybe a little bit more thought needs to go into um, uh, what we call it to get the right, um, the right outcomes that we're looking for. Okay, can you come in shortly? Sure. Right. Uh, I'd like to move on to workforce planning, although Joanne might want to come back to the previous point. We were at, uh, I'd like to put on record my thanks to Keppel Campus today for a fantastic visit. I think everybody that was there this afternoon really got a lot from it and uh, the pupils are an absolute uh, joy um, and, and the teachers were clearly committed to, to the school. We, we spoke to a number of the ASN teachers in Broomley uh, and they said that one of the issues they had was a kind of difficulty in recruiting teachers. Uh, actually, St. Teresa said the same thing, although uh, Saracen seemed to have much less difficulty with that. Could you tell us, do you think the regional collaboratives will help, particularly around about the ASN one, where the, there's, there seems to be a shortage of those sort of teachers? Is there a possibility that across the regional collaboratives there might be scope for teachers to, to share that burden? 
I mean, at, at present, within the West Partnership, we, we are not seeing the need to go down the road that the Northern Alliance had to go down a number of years ago um, uh, in terms of recruitment of staff. You know, we, we are the sort of biggest partnership. We do get the bulk of students. We also get the bulk of NQTs, uh, and it makes recruitment a bit easier for us. Uh, in terms of additional support needs, I think there's always been a difficulty in recruiting staff into additional support needs. To a certain extent, it, does, it is a, a vocational calling for some, and for others, they, they tend to sort of drift into it, and that, and that doesn't always lead to best outcomes. However, one area that we are uh, and have agreed to look at is the recruitment of head teachers. That is continuing to be problematic across the region, uh, and it's something that, that we could explore in terms of succession planning, uh, and, and not necessarily thinking that, that you know, East Renfrewshire should be succession planning for itself, but that we would you know, be developing the leaders of tomorrow across the region uh, and all of us benefiting from that. I don't know if Maureen wanted to come in about something specific about... Um, just, I suppose, it is a challenge for us um, to, to recruit an additional support needs, and, and we're actively looking at that um, across the city. And I think part of the challenge is, um, is because there's a shortage of teachers. So there's, there's work um, across the board. I think that we, we certainly are going to make that in the city a focus for us next year to look at how we work with our probationers because our probationers, um, are, are, they need to do their first year in a mainstream okay. school. They can't reach the standard for full registration. And so there's a blocker in the system from the outset. Um, so we really need to look at that to ensure that we are giving them a breadth of experience because sometimes it's just they don't know what they don't know. Um, and, and to enable that. Uh, I, I was really glad you said that because one of the things that came across loud and clear uh, when we were talking to teachers today was that there seems to be blockages in becoming you know, assisted learning teacher than, uh, than being a primary school teacher, for example. And I think that something has to be done to make sure that that route is, is as straightforward, if it's ever a straightforward route, but as straightforward as it is for any other type of education. OK, Ruth, do you want to come in? No, sorry, I thought you wanted to come in later. Gillian, you want? It leads on from that. Are you collaborating with teacher training? Uh, colleges, universities, around how you can um, modify or be innovative around the type of courses that they provide to encourage people coming into teacher training. I'm thinking specifically people who are in other sectors who might want to retrain as teachers but can't give up their job for fam family reasons. So maybe part-time um, opportunities. In the, in the West, um, we've been working um, as a West grouping for a number of years with initial teacher education providers, not in that specific example that you gave there about um, workforce planning and about retraining, um, but more about initial teacher education and trying to enhance the quality uh, of teacher education by um, having a stronger focus on a partnership approach. So the balance of assessment um, between lecturers and teachers in schools, and that's been going on for a number of years across, and it's just coincidentally, it happens to be the same um, eight education authorities. Uh, in fact, we applied for funding a number of years ago uh, from Scottish Government for teacher education. Um, so we have been working with them, and it may be an area that we go on to look at. In, in respect of the, the changing profession in Glasgow City Council, um, an example we've had is working with Strathclyde, where we've looked at, we've put a plea out where we had a job fair, and we put a plea out for people who had degrees who would be interested in a change in career, but were stuck because they, they needed for family reasons to keep a salary coming in. And we've been able, in areas of identified need, um, to be able to support them financially, to enable them to do the postgraduate year, and then they've got to come back into Glasgow to teach. But small scale. Just ask one, thank you, Camino, one um, supplementary on workforce planning and, and um, the, the changing profession that 
has just been described, the one consistent message we got this afternoon, and I certainly heard it very consistently over some months now since the proposals came out, is on the GTCS, on the General Teaching Council of Scotland, leave it well alone. Do you understand why teachers are saying, it seems to us, so clearly that they wish that organisation, their professional organisation, left well alone and not reformed in the way in which it's currently being considered? I, I haven't had any discussions with head teachers about that, I have to say. I, I, I do think that the GTC, as it was in, in my day, w um, has a special place in the hearts of teachers in Scotland. I think they do see it as the, the keeper of the standard, if you like. They do make sure that the right people uh, almost always get into education a, a, and are right and proper to be in front of children. And in that sort of sense, though, though I'm not um, from the Form seeing that that uh, particular remit would change, but indeed that there, there might be a sort of lengthening or a, a broadening out of the uh, of the remit to include CLD uh, and the standards set out within that. So I, I do think it, it does have a sort of historically, um, it's always been something that set Scotland apart from uh, other parts of the United Kingdom in particular, uh, and as such is well protected by the teaching profession. Just on your uh, earlier question about um, innovative practice around initial teacher education, we're, we're currently part of a pilot um, in Inverclyde working with one of the, the um, universities looking at people training whilst still maintaining their job within the council. So we, we um, give them time off, they, they, they do Saturday mornings and evening um, lectures, but we will give them time off to take, uh, undertake their teaching practice. Okay. Yes, I wonder if ADES has a view on um, GTC, the changes? Um, we're in the process of putting together our, our final response and um, we don't have actually a, a very strong view. I would endorse um, Mary's view of the, the GTCS having a special place in the, in the hearts of all teachers. Um, what we are going to ask for is that a financial assessment is carried out of what would it cost to change um, the GTCS towards an Education Workforce Council because there's no mention of that and I understand that um, the way GTCS is set up as an independent um, body um, that there may be implications around that from my discussions with the Chief Executive um, of GTCS there may be financial implications that should be fully explored um, before any decision is taken. I wonder if you think there are professional concerns, I mean my sense from the meeting earlier was the concern would be there would be a blurring of responsibilities and roles which would perhaps diminish the role of the teacher within education. And I wonder if you, if that is an anxiety, and B, would it be a sufficient anxiety for you perhaps to suggest the Scottish Government should think about this again? Because the strength of feeling at our meeting certainly took me by surprise. I thought it was a wee add-on mm -hmm. at the end of the meeting. But it was a very strong view. There was an issue about maintaining the integrity and standards of teaching in Scotland. Yeah. I think that I, I think there's ways around that. I, it's not an anxiety for me. I think the challenge is that that the General Teaching Council has been established as a as a member organisation, and as a member organisation, that's a huge strength. So teachers are on their board, mm -hmm. um, and therefore to change that um, without really thinking through uh, the repercussions of that. Um, how do you, what would happen to that member board? Because that member board is set out um, in the legislation that governs GTCS. One of the challenges that ADES has is that we don't have a place on that board. Um, we do in partnership with COSLA, but not ADES itself. Directors of Education don't have a place on the board. It's only through agreement with COSLA. And so I think that there's a, a number of, again, I'm back to unintended consequences that really need to be more fully explored um, and, and teased out that rather than just, a, well, let's just change it. Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to parental and community involvement. Uh, can I just ask a question about, we, we talk about stakeholders uh, uh, and their involvement in how would you see their role in the uh, City Region Collaborative, Glasgow City Region Collaborative, uh, and also particularly, I suppose, colleges and young people? How would they be involved in it? Colleges have obviously got a central role to play in this. How would you see them being involved in it? 
at, at present, uh, um, within the West Partnership, we sit across three different regional um, bodies. We have a regional um, developing the young workforce uh, region. We have college regions and indeed the regional improvement collaborative. This is an opportunity for us to really sort of look at bringing all of those together so that we can work on uh, the same agenda. For instance, in uh, East Renfrewshire, we don't have a college. Uh, and we sit across two college uh, regions, uh, but only feed into one regional outcome agreement. So it, it makes, um, it, we, we seem to dance to lots of different papers, is what I'm trying to say. So I, I think this is an opportunity to redress that. Um, but uh, we do have an intention that under the learner journey theme, that that would be something that we could explore where there are opportunities to really look at the offer, especially in the senior phase and in different curricular pathways for youngsters, and indeed being able to access, them, access such across uh, the whole region rather than just particularly within the one that you sit in. So, um, FE, I have a meeting set up with Robin Ashton, for instance, in the next couple of weeks, uh, who is the chief executive of the, the Glasgow board, um, uh, to explore those areas, uh, and then we'll sort of look at how we can bring others into that. Um, in terms of stakeholders or other stakeholders, uh, I think certainly in terms of um, a bottom-up approach, head teachers would involve uh, both young people and children uh, and indeed uh, parents in determining uh, what the school priorities would be. And if this is going to genuinely be in a school-led, teacher-led system, then that should feed up into the regional improvement, collaborative improvement plans. Um, whether or not there is an opportunity, I have a, a meeting, I think, in the next couple of weeks with Joanne, who I think is still in the audience. Yep. Uh, uh, to consider how parental uh, engagement and the National Parent Forum for Scotland can uh, help and support uh, and considering those views. At the moment, uh, we don't have parental involvement uh, or engagement. And, and, and I'm not sure that in a, a region so large uh, that, it, that it is going to be something that needs to be um, considered, but certainly, if it is going to be considered, it has to be meaningful. It can't just be, you know, parent council chairs getting together and saying uh, these are the things we think you should do. Thank you very much for that. Just for the record, could you give us Joanne's full name so that we can? Thank you. Uh, very briefly, we've only got five minutes left. Too late. You're on the record, Joanne. Uh, <laughs> we, very briefly. Very brief. Thank you, convener, and it's on. Um, family and parent involvement and, and how you um, communicate and involve with the very, very hard to reach parents. And there could be a number of reasons. We heard earlier on today, one of the possible reasons could be parents that have a particularly poor educational experience themselves and they're very, very difficult to engage with. And there is a key role there for the family support worker. And we spoke to a family support worker today. And do you think more emphasis should be put into family support workers and the crucial role that they can play in bringing difficult or hard to reach parents in, into the, the, the communication circle of the school? Um, I suppose I have a question over whether it's a family support worker. Um, what is a family support worker? I think we would have to be very clear about the definition of that. But I do think that there is a very strong role for our third sector partners. Um, to work very closely with our families and with our schools and to act as that bridge between um, home and school. Our schools and our teachers are outstanding at delivering education, um, but family support is not their bailiwick, um, and they need to have, I think, a third sector role is very strong and very powerful there, and that's what we should be um, putting our energies into, and I think. Just absolutely agreeing and expanding on that point the this is not a one person one one job role there are varieties of support, supports the harder to reach families need children's services the third sector all sorts of imaginative approaches that that schools are currently beginning to use for that i think there's a real danger that it, it's one it's described as one job description and it becomes one role and that's simply not going to work i think there is some very very good practice around the around the country at the moment in that aspect 
Matt Joanne and then Tavish. I'm going to say, I don't think I agree with Maureen McKenna on this issue about um, home links and how you work between schools and families. As someone who did partly as part of my teaching job, um, that engagement with, with families, I actually think it would be the responsibility of the whole school rather than just the third sector. And I would be concerned that that was something that wasn't seen as part of a central role. I'm interested in the, this issue about participation again from the group earlier. Head teachers felt very strongly that they worked very hard on pupil engagement and involvement and parental engagement and involvement. I wonder what you think a duty to do these things would look like and what consequences would it be? How would you judge a head teacher wasn't fulfilling that duty? Because if it's not, if it can't be assessed and dealt with, then it's not a meaningful duty to impose on a head teacher. And, and you think our head teachers today were right to be A, concerned that there seemed to be suggestion this wasn't happening, and B, that they needed there to be a duty placed on them in order to ensure that they actually fulfilled this role? Can I have very brief answers, please, because we're just coming to... I mean, I, I do think there is emerging practice. I do think that schools are using the PEF fund, essentially. Um, but, you know, if head teachers are going to be in charge of their staffing and they determine that that is going to bring about outcomes, then they will bring in other bodies. In my experience, um, parents haven't always had good relationships with teachers, not just because of their own experience of school, but indeed because some teachers find it difficult to relate to parents. So I, I think that, um, that that is something that can be then delivered by other partners where there's not the same baggage, for instance. But um, Education Scotland is tasked with evaluating a school uh, in all aspects of the duties that they have to deliver. Uh, and it will be interesting to watch how their practice in inspecting schools evolves uh, uh, and how they evaluate family learning and family engagement. That certainly will be one to watch. Well, I'm just going to agree with you, Mary. Parents and teachers sometimes just don't get on, but that may have been me as a parent. But anyway, um, can I just thank you, uh, all three of you, for what you said earlier on about governance? Because I think you've been very helpful on, on trying to clarify where the lines of accountability are. So I guess I've got one final question, Convener, and that is that uh, I very much understand from your evidence today where local authorities sit and where now your West Regional Collaborative sit. What's the point of Education Scotland in all this? What will they add to your party? I, I do think that Education Scotland has a role to play in this. They have a national picture that we don't necessarily have and will be able to identify where there is practice and opportunity to learn from uh, elsewhere in the country. Uh, thank you very much, then. That, that takes us to the, the end of this. Can I thank you all for the evidence you've given today? And I hope you will stay for the informal discussions on the forums. And that is the end of the formal meeting. Thank you again.